Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Appreciate uh, your presence. Thank you, Pastor Josh, for reading the scripture, for leading uh, with the praise team, the worship songs that prepares our heart to receive his word. Uh, you know, as, as uh, Pastor Josh said, we're moving into um, the second part of our series, uh, God Made in God's Image, and we're going to be look, looking specifically at what is a man. Welcome to those online, too, if I didn't say that already. I'm Pastor Brian, if you didn't know that already. Uh, I um, appreciate, again, your presence here at That We Could Worship Together. So let's pray before we begin. Father, as we come here this morning, and maybe we're thinking about the attempted assassination of former President Trump yesterday, it could be on our minds and our hearts as it's been on the news 24 hours so far. We pray, Father, that as our hearts might be unsettled and maybe feeling sadness of how our nation is in such a divided state, because of your great love demonstrated through your son, Jesus Christ, his life, his death, and resurrection, we know that you love us and accept every one of us, man, woman, and child. We are gathered here to worship you, and may you, please, may you calm our hearts. May you bring peace to our souls in such chaotic times to hear your word as you minister to us by your spirit. We pray this in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So, you know, there's a lot on our minds, but I do pray that the Holy Spirit would calm our hearts, that we could hear God's word in this, I think, important series about identity and how we might identify ourselves. You know, when I say back in the day, it's like a long time ago. So back in the day, when I was in high school and during my college years, I remember, and some of you might remember that, we were struggling with some similar things that you're struggling with today as a young person. Uh, and we called that an identity crisis. It was just actually called an identity crisis. And uh, questions like, who am I and what's my purpose, uh, were asked by teens and college-age people like myself. You know, it was a genuine and deep, deep concern for me and many others in that time, and so much so that some even considered taking their lives because of the confusion of their self. They were lost. We were lost. It was, we, were, we were stuck in our lostness. And lostness is a lonely place, if you've been there before, where everyone except you seems to know who they are and a sense of where they belong. Compared to when I was going through this, uh, this time, it's hard to comprehend uh, the difficulties of this generation's identity crisis. Today in our series about identity, we are looking more specifically at answering the question, what is a man, from the scripture you see. And because a man's purpose is closely tied with his identity, the answer to this question, what is a man, uh, will be talked about in two parts. Who is man and what is his purpose? The answer seems simple enough in our minds, but to today's context, I, I think it's really uh, complex, really complex. De de defining a man is, is not as simple as it once was because of the various pronouns and <clears throat> that people use to identify oneself. Today, was, today we'll be looking at different ways people identify themselves. It can be complicated and confusing, but to love and respect our neighbors, I think it's important that we try very hard to address, best address a person's preferred gender identity. Understanding pronouns is essential to address people accurately and respectfully. Using the correct pronouns for someone is important just like pronouncing their name correctly is important. It shows respect and love to that person that you are communicating with. Most, if not all, of our younger generation, and you can place yourself wherever that might look, yet the younger generation will be familiar with a few terms that I'm going to kind of go over, just a very brief summary. Uh, but for people of my generation, again, wherever you want to place yourself, uh, may not be aware of these phrases. They're very common terms in many people's minds, but for, for a person my, like myself, I was like, it took me a while to, to really understand this stuff. So the identity crisis happening today, I think, is in a whole new world, a whole new context. And here are just a few words that I found helpful in understanding some difficulties uh, in defining who we are. So you see here a chart, the three words binary, non-binary, and transgender. So binary defines a person in the two categories of either a man or a woman. The term cisgender 
falls into this category where a person identifies with the sex in which they were born. In today's vocabulary, I'm cisgender. Non-binary is a term used by those who do not describe themselves or their genders as fitting into the categories of a man or woman. They, them, is an example of a term used by those who identify as non-binary people. So an example of a person who is uh, non-binary uh, is transgender. So transgender, or simply trans, is an adjective used to describe someone whose gender identity differs from their sex at birth. Transgender people may be lesbian, gay, bisexual, or queer. For transgender people, gender identity differs in varying degrees from their sex at birth. So these are terms that are kind of explains what's happening and the confusion that goes with that. So these are a few terms that people identify themselves. So, so why is this important? Why is this important to understand? Okay, so Mary Emily O'Hara, a communications director officer at GLAD, she says this, pronouns are basically how we identify ourselves apart from our name. It's how, we, how someone refers to you in conversation, says Mary Emily O'Hara, a communications officer at GLAD. And when you're speaking to people, it's really simple way to affirm their identity. Using the correct pronouns for trans and non-binary people is a way to let them know that you see them, that you affirm them, that you accept them, and to let them know that they're loved during a time when they're already being so targeted. You know, this church, uh, your church, San Lo, strives to be, what this says here, a gospel community of growth for every generation, to bridge between cultures, ethnicities, and generations Having some understanding of the vocabulary people are using can help bridge these gaps. For my generation, it's a willingness to acknowledge the younger generation's way of identifying themselves. For most people, gender identity aligns with the sex they were born with. Being born male or female identifies you as a boy or a girl, a man or a woman. Today, it's not as simple as that, which I feel adds to the present identity crisis that people are going through. As followers of Jesus Christ, you who know Jesus Christ and as Lord and Savior, we are all called to love our neighbors. In light of yesterday's assassination attempt upon former President Trump, loving and respecting others with differing views is a highly urgent matter. As Christians, we need to do our best to usher in the peace of God in the divisive atmosphere that we currently live in. This includes loving and respecting those who identify themselves differently than we may be used to. It's challenging, but it's a call to love our neighbors. And maybe, you know, you might be anxious like me in addressing a person correctly. You might ask, but what if I make a mistake using the incorrect pronouns so you say nothing? If you make a mistake, which I know I have and we probably will, and use the wrong pronoun for someone, don't dwell on it or make excuses. Simply apologize, restate what you said using the correct pronoun, if you know it, and then carry on. What's important is recognizing and respecting, <coughs> respecting people as individuals of being created by God. For this morning's message, I wanted to briefly touch upon these terms to acknowledge that in today's world, asking what is a man is not as straightforward as it may seem like it was in the past. Gender identity is a complex subject that needs our best understanding and sensitivity. Yet at the same time, we need to also understand how God has created us and what he desires for us. So with the challenges, questions, and confusion about what a man is today, I appreciate that God made me a man because I am made in his image. What we when we consider that we are created in the image of God, it's really mind-blowing that we are created in the image of God. There are two types of men, those who know God through Jesus Christ and those who don't. This is an important distinction that we'll be looking at. Though there will be overlaps in describing what a man is, the man who has believed in and received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior has the advantage of having an unchanging resource or guidance, the Bible, God's letter to humankind, and guiding us and understand our identity. 
A man is defined either by what the world says or by what God says. Another way to look at it is, what does the word of the world or the word of God say about men? I speak from what I believe is the most credible, the most dependable, and unchanging resource about life's answers. This morning, we will identify a man who is made in the image of God according to the word of God, not the word of the world. So what is a man? What is a man according to the word of God, and what is a man's purpose according to the word of God? So what is a man according to the word of God? A man according to the word of God is created in the image of God. God made man to be in his likeness. A man of God models his life according to the pattern of God. A man is created in the image of God and is to live in the pattern of God. Genesis 1, 26 to 27. You can look on the screen or look in your Bibles. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Though man was the last creature mentioned in the creation account, man did not evolve. He was created. Man was created in or in the essence of the image of God. This image was imparted only to humans, to mankind. Being in God's image means that humans share, though imperfectly and finite, finitely, in God's nature. That in his communicable, communicable attributes like life, personality, truth, wisdom, love, holiness, justice, and, and so forth, we can identify and have spiritual fellowship with God because we are made in the likeness of God. You know, when my dad died in 2014, it was a very sad time, as you can imagine. It's 10 years ago. I still feel some of that grief, and, you know, I don't think grief ever, ever disappears. But there was even a funny moment in that time that I thought would be a, a good illustration or example of what it's uh, like being, in, made, being made in the likeness of another. So, you know, I've heard many, many times how much I look like my dad, the way I, I talk, the way I act, the way my build, all these things, the way I walk even. And my mom and dad lived in a really good assisted care facility in Seattle. So as they were living there for the last few years of their life, it was not only a very well-kept, clean building, but the staff took very good care of mom and dad. And they knew my parents very well as they were very involved in their lives. On the day that my father died, one of the staff was making their rounds and opened to check on my mom. And I was with my mom in their units sitting on the couch. I wish I could have taken a picture of the look on that poor woman's face when she saw me sitting on that couch. You can imagine. She thought I was my dad. She thought I was my dad. Her eyes were so big, I thought they were going to pop out. And her jaw seemed like it dropped to the floor. Can you imagine what she must have been thinking, knowing my dad had just died that morning and now sitting on the couch? That was a, a moment that was, it made me laugh in my sadness. It was a great uh, comic relief at that moment. The point is, I am and was the spitting image of my dad to this poor woman. Similarly, a man is made in the image of God. His likeness, his likeness. The, tr the traditional view of a man leans more towards a biblical view. God is a provider, a protector, and leader who provides stability and security in our lives. So should man be. A man of God should also have the qualities of compassion, humbleness, grace, mercy, and love, to name a few, as God does. I feel honored and blessed to be thought of in the likeness of my father as God's creation. I hope people see my heavenly father in me in the same way they see me in my earthly father. Genesis 1:27 again. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis, Genesis affirms that every human being is made in the image of God. This means that humankind 
mankind, both male and female, represent God on earth. This is a prayer and hope that all followers of Jesus Christ, that the world may know the Father through you and I who know Christ as Lord and Savior. This is the prayer, that as we look at our lives, that they would see the Heavenly Father, that we are in the likeness of our Father, that the world might know him through how they see the love in us. On the other hand, for me, the words of the world about a man are very confusing because of how the definition of man has changed over time. Some of you might remember that it used to be that a man was defined as chivalrous, macho, non-emotional, a stoic being with lots of muscles. This was what made a man's man back in the day. Being in touch with their feelings, the emotions of others, taking care of your skin, makeup, manis, and petties. In the past, that was more for women, but now it's part, part of being a man. And so it's, in my mind, if you've lived through that period, it's, it's, it can be very confusing. It can be confusing knowing what a man is based upon the word of the world because the word of the world changes. Whereas the word of God is unchanging. The words of the world change and shift with cultures, but God's word does not change and will continue to remind men of their value. The word of God is not as concerned with the external part of a man as it is with the internal part and heart of man. It does not change in speaking to the eternal value of man's worth, of integrity and grace, because man is made in the image of God. So we've learned that according to the word of God, man is created in the image of God to live according to the pattern of God. Next we'll see how God defines a man through his purpose. A man's purpose according to the word of God is to populate and protect the earth. A man of God understands that he is to multiply and take care of this world. He oversees what God has created and is brave and courageous enough to rule over every living thing as God so rules. A man's purpose according to the word of God is to populate and protect the earth in accordance with God's word. Genesis 1, 28 through 31. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that it moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. You know, this creation account reaches its climax on this sixth day. Note how much fuller the description of God's work was on this day compared to the previous five days of creation. Genesis defines man's purpose to populate and protect the earth. Man as God's representative must rule his subjects in the same way that God would. God's purpose in creating man in his image was functional. While legitimizing human use of the world's resource, God desires his people to populate and protect the earth and not abuse or misuse his creation. Dominion implies lordship, not exploitation. The word of God says that because men are created in his image, they are his representatives on earth and have dominion over all and authority over all the earth. The psalmist King David offers a poetic comment on the same thought. Psalms 8, 4 through 6. When I look at your heavens, says King David, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set place, set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him a dominion over the works of your hands. You have put, things all, you have put all things under his feet. So just recently... And while I'm preparing for this sermon, I, had, I came upon a recycling thing in my own life. 
And, you know, recycling is a good thing, but it can be difficult because it's, it's, there are a lot of things that go on with recycling. But it's worth the effort to make it because it helps to protect and care for this world. And this is not everyone's conviction. This is what was convicted upon me when I'm preparing for this sermon and before. No, so, for instance, what I'm talking about is an example of how recycling can be challenging. I recently found out that painted wood is not accepted as compost. Makes sense. At garbage landfills, at ha hazardous waste facilities, or even those free bulky waste pickups. It's not accepted or received at these places. Landfills, hazardous waste, free bulky pickup, or the garbage. So what are you going to do? And that's my question right now. I don't know what to do. So when I'm preparing for this message, you know, I have a saw at home, a power saw, and it's only like half my truck, so it's not much for me to cut into pieces, these pieces of wood, and throw them in a black garbage bag, and then throw it in the garbage can. Who's going to look at the black garbage bag? Nobody. That's the temptation I have. And I, I am fighting that because I have no idea where to go. One person in the uh, waste management told me, you have to go to Livermore to do this delivery of this painted wood. And I go, and Livermore is not that far, I understand, for people at Livermore. But <laughs> for me to go to Livermore to discard a piece of wood that I could cut up and throw in a garbage bag is, is some work for myself. The point of this, this illustration is that, you know, I'm learning and growing to be a man of God. And for me, the conviction is, how do I protect this world? And recycling is one small way that I can do that and actually do it. It might be costly, but it's worth it, and that's the call that God has for us. So, you know, when I began this message, I talked about the changing climate of gender identity, gender and identity. And we have come to see that to love our neighbors, we need to learn how to love and respect others who might view life differently than us. At the same time, God has created man to live according to his word to fulfill his purposes. More profoundly, that we might be men of character, as the Apostle Paul urged in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 to 14. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. Those are strong words by Paul the Apostle. Paul was exhorting leaders of that time to act like men, to be brave, to be strong and courageous in the face of challenges of being a leader, which at times can be very uncomfortable, it can be very risky, and sometimes dangerous. He was also speaking from his own experience, the Apostle Paul. Remember that before Paul became a Christian, before he knew Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he was a high-ranking Pharisee who persecuted Christians, beat them up, jailed them, and even had some put to death. When Paul became a follower of Jesus Christ, he made the hard and courageous and brave decision to leave being a Pharisee. He not only left the prestigious, prestige, prestigious position of power, but some family and friends abandoned him for his faith in Christ. Paul walked the talk. He stood firm in the faith. You know, man, there might be times in our lives that we need to make hard and costly decisions in our pursuit of Jesus Christ. But as Paul exhorts, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, and let all that you do be done in love. You might need to make the hard decision in your family to confront wrong attitudes that negatively affect your spouse, your children, your siblings, your aunts, your uncles, etc., those are hard decisions that as a man of God, you might have to confront. Maybe there is a need to speak to a, a male co-worker who is treating a female co-worker inappropriately. That takes courage because you're risking possibly your job and ridicule. Is there a family friend or co-worker that is being mistreated because of how they identify themselves? What is the Spirit of God saying to you in these situations and beyond as you think about how God wants all of us, men in particular in this passage, to take that step. 
to make that decision, the hard decision, the courageous decision, to stand firm in the faith and act like men. But all of this is to be done in love. You know, we could be, it could be the other way where we become so uh, militant that we just kind of bowl over everybody in our, our machoism. That's not what God's saying. He's saying, in understanding who I am as your father, there are things in this world that we need to take responsibility for to step out and confront those things that we see are not right. We need to be strong in our faith, act like men, but do it all in love. Even in this climate with, with what's going on right now with uh, former President Trump and the divisiveness of this nation, it starts small with you and I and how we communicate to each other. Whether or not we agree or disagree with each other, it doesn't matter. It's respecting and loving one another as God calls us to love our neighbors as followers of Jesus Christ. You know, when we hear these things in the news about this is it's condemned, violence is condemned, and the way that we are acting towards one another, it's a very broad and general statement. But I think as followers of Jesus Christ, each one of us who know him, we can take that small step, the courageous step, but small step, of trying to be peacemakers in a world that is full of conflict and chaos. These are some of the things that we are called as men to do, but also as people, as mankind created, male and female, in the image of God. Next week, Pastor Eric will be talking about women being made in the image of God, so he'll probably expound upon some of this more. But for now, what is a man? A man made in the image of God is a man of strong faith, protects all of God's creations, and loves as God loves. It's a challenging message, but I hope that we can take it to heart and make a difference in this world, impact this world for the cause of Jesus Christ, that every generation would be the gospel, we would be a gospel community, the gospel community of Christ for every generation. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your word. We are grateful that <clears throat> you don't pull punches, that <clears throat> you can bring calm and peace in our hearts in a divisive and chaotic world when we turn to you. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit, the power of your Holy Spirit, can bring us that peace, that we can bring peace to others as you have so promised us, that we can have the peace that so <clears throat> surpasses all understanding when we come before you. Father, give us the courage as men and women to stand for you, to stand for you in ways that would respect and love others who might differ in opinion or perspective than us. It's challenging, Father, because we are sinful, imperfect people who hold on to things that we think are right, but remind us that right, <clears throat> rightness only comes from the righteousness of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.